So basically, we've been looking at abstract art, haven't we? We started with abstract expressionism, and then we've been looking at later trends in abstract art. And I'll say a little bit more about abstract art at the very beginning today, but soon we're going to move to look at very different kind of art. Abstract expressionism is tied to largely a, a sort of turn inward, you know, towards the unconscious, towards some kind of transcendental, some kind of spirituality expressed through art. That's not a new thing because with abstract art, because that's actually similar to the the motivation of the the founders of abstract art, artists like Kandinsky and Mondrian. You know, Kandinsky wrote a book called Concerning the Spiritual in Art. You know, that his motivations were were, were very much in that way. But then we saw artists like Frank Stella say, working in the nineteen sixties onwards still using pretty much the format of abstract expressionism, large-scale, unitary canvases, something of the visual language of that art, but without any concern for the spirituality or deep inner meaning that was there with abstract expressionism. And the kind of guiding aesthetic, aesthetic idea with that is more about formal purity, the self-contained work of art that is what it is and doesn't have to uh, convey any meaning beyond it itself, the purely accessible, purely visual object. Uh, and that kind of approach to art making, a sort of formalistic approach to art making, was one that was much supported in art theory, art criticism, art history, particularly by the critic Clement Greenberg, who told the story of modern art's development of art from the time of Manet, really, becoming more and more purely concerned with formal issues. And that was a very convenient story, which saw American art of the post-war period as being a sort of culmination of a development that started with Manet and went through artists like uh, Picasso or Mondrian. So it, it was a kind of hegemonizing narrative for, uh, for American art. But that idea starts to break down really in the 1960s. That's a kind of crucial moment for uh, art. Uh, and a word that was often used to describe that moment uh, not so much at the time, but a little bit later, was the word postmodernism, an idea that somehow a narrative of progress in modern art had broken down. Nowadays, we don't hear that word postmodernism so much. It was very, it was everywhere at a, cer at a certain time. Uh, now we're more likely to hear a distinction between modern and contemporary. Um, that's perhaps a less theorized distinction in, in many ways, but uh, a more common one nowadays. Anyway, around that time of the 1960s, we saw um, various different new directions in art, and that followed on with new directions in art theory, art history, art criticism too. Uh, one new direction, which we'll look at uh, very, very soon today, uh, is towards going back towards imagery. And that's exemplified particularly by pop art. It's not a kind of conservative going back to realism, a sort of pre-modernist idiom. It's very much a modern of the moment approach to art, but it goes back to the image. So it offers a break with notions of formal purity and abstractness in art. That's one way ahead. Another way ahead was that offered by minimalism, and that's something we'll be looking at in not too much time as well. Minimalism sort of takes the premise of, of purity and then pushes it beyond its limits and to, so it sort of breaks down. If you get to a point where um, a canvas is so 
simplified, that there's almost nothing to look at in it, no internal differentiations. It's becoming kind of more or less monochrome. We saw that, for instance, with certain late works by Ad Reinhardt. Then a funny thing happens that you start to become less concerned with what's going on within the campus and more concerned with the whole space around it in which the canvas is one thing that is happening. So you start to become concerned with the whole environment. So that way lies, ahead that way lies installation art, environmental art, but perhaps first of all minimalism, uh, which sort of push the problems with painting into a world of three dimensions, three dimensional art objects. The, the very simplified uh, monochrome canvas starts to be thought of as a thing, a three dimensional thing in a real space. Uh, and, uh, a, and a lot of minimalist art we'll see is art that somehow takes off from problems that were initially problems to, uh, uh, of painting, but actually become solutions become in three dimensions. But there's another way ahead which I just want to refer to before we go on to look at pop and post-pop art and then at minimalism uh, and that is those artists who carried on making abstract art but they carried on making it without a belief in some kind of spiritual meaning that abstract art could carry like abstract expressionism or without a belief in formal purity that artists like Frank Stella perhaps could, could believe in. But still they felt there's a way of making abstract art. So that's sort of, if you like, abstract art under the conditions of postmodernity or, you know, abstract art beyond a belief that abstract art is the way to make art. It's a little bit like <coughs> the problem that realist artists faced in the modern period. You know, there, there are artists who, who didn't give up on using realism as an idiom in the modern and postmodern or contemporary period. There still are such artists. But um, apart from those artists who are sort of very conservative in their thinking and sort of want to reject the whole of modernism, you know, it's a very uh, backward looking view which produces very little interesting art. The, 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 the interesting realist art is that produced by artists who aware that realism is just one possible style amongst others, that it isn't just the right way or the only way to make art. But nevertheless, they want to push ahead and make art using that idiom, aware of it as up just one stylistic choice amongst others. I'm thinking of an artist, say, like Lucien Freud. You know, it's realism as a kind of chosen option. Actually, you could find an equivalent, say, in Chinese modernism for artists who they're aware of Western modernist idioms, but they choose to carry on using ink painting as the, their chosen technical or stylistic uh, basis. Uh, of course, some of them are traditionalists who just reject all modern things and want to do things the way they were done in the Yuan dynasty or something like that. That's not likely to produce much of interest, but many ink painters did do interesting things because they were aware that they were, were modern, living in a modern world and trying to use ink painting as one possible option amongst many. So those abstract artists who are aware that abstraction is just the style, it's one possible style, are the ones I want to briefly look at here. Yeah. Um, when did it become sort of I would say normal that artists would, uh, in their repertoire, include sort of installation, painting, sculpture, video, or perhaps within one exhibition, where they're making all different kinds of work at the same time. They're less exploring one medium over and over in the same way like Jackson Pollock would. Yeah. And yeah. when they, it becomes more perhaps about an exhibition than individual works for the exhibition. That's a sort of, and I, then, I think that's largely a later moment where people felt that they could move uh, from completely different idioms to other. We've, we, 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 I mean, the first artist I want to look at is Gerhard Richter, and he's exactly that kind of artist who will use more than one idiom within his oeuvre, you know. Yeah. Uh, he'll, he'll paint images uh, that are in a kind of 
very imagistic style like this, but he'll also paint completely abstract paintings too. So, uh, and another solution that develops early with pop art is the idea of including more than one style within the same image, you know. But actually I would say that big diversity of media, first of all, those <coughs> new media have to develop, you know, so that you can't, it's not, to, it's actually the moment of video is quite late, you know, the moment when you have the ability to, to for a handheld video camera or something, that's basically quite a late moment. So it's only when you have that that you can jump from that kind of medium to, to painting or something within it, within your, your, your practice. So I think one big uh, aspect of that is uh, what happens in art school where someone trains in there in the painting school but they're spending all the time making videos, that sort of thing, and whether the school encourages and allows that kind of thing or, you know, uh, sometimes in, in a lot of art training and design training, the practice is that you have a foundation year before you go on to specialize. So in your foundation year, the, and this goes really all the way back to Bauhaus uh, practice or even to the Russian art schools that inspired the Bauhaus, the idea that you expose yourself to many different media. The idea is that at that age maybe you shouldn't be already jumping to choose one media. You should learn how different media is handled before you decide for sure if you're a painter or a sculptor or whatever it turns out to be. So uh, it's sort of built into art school training and, and from quite early on that you, there should be some kind of diversity. So maybe it's not altogether that new, you know, Picasso or Matisse were making sculptures as well as painting. Is it so different, you know, that an artist like Kirchner made an oil painting that also wood cuts, you know? It's, uh, it's just that there are new mediums available now. So things sort of feel a bit, a bit different in a way. Do you think perhaps there was maybe like a, a distaste for maybe abstract expressionism and Greenberg's formalism as sort of like a male yes. autonomous, yes, I like think romantic? So. Yeah, that, that it's definitely once that idea breaks down that you know purity or you know that the art lies in honing down your practice in one particular channel. Once that idea is broken down, all sorts of things become possible. Um, which is you know which is not to say that that's it's always a good thing that people are sort of jumping around and not having a strong technical base. Sometimes certain things can only become possible if we really stick with a particular medium, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are some disadvantages, say, when art schools, you know, a lot of art schools, even by the 1980s, it would be very hard to get life drawing, uh, you know. So you, you, the possibility of, of doing work in a realist idiom almost disappears if you can't even have a life drawing lessons and study human anatomy and such and such. So, you know, certain options close down in that way. I, I think looking at it from the perspective of training is quite quite important in that respect. Yeah. So let, let's just look at Richter, who's my main example of a kind of artist uh, using abstraction after the idea that abstraction is the answer, the only way. And it's explicit in his work that it's not the only way because he himself isn't using it as, as his only direction. He's also making these more realist image, but not images from life. They're, they're very much, very self-consciously images after photography. Uh, this, is, this is very common with uh, pop art, you know, the idea that you can... Uh, take an image that is, um, you know, exists in the world of mass re reproduced uh, forms, and then you can try to 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 change it in, in, in some way or make a handmade version of it. So this is XL 513, 1964. So it's really from around the same time as pop art is coming into being in 
the U in its U.S. incarnation, the early 1960s. So, um, I think one characteristic that is a <coughs> technically it's sort of specific to photography is blur. You know, you don't really normally get blur in painting. Blur is sort of specific to the kind of the, 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 the nature of photography as, as a shutter open for a certain period of time and then objects in motion uh, start, can start to look blurred. It's, a, it's one of the way, ways in which realism breaks down in photography. Photography is thought of as a kind of ultimate realistic tool to perfect uh, the, the, the copying of nature but actually, you know, because it involves uh, light uh, being caught over a period of time, even if that period of time is only a sixtieth of a second or something, a fast-moving move, object, you'd s certainly start to see um, some kind of blur coming in. Even uh, or where you don't see blur, you see a frozenness that also is something that the human eye doesn't normally come across. You know, very very high-speed photography freezes motion in a way that the eye doesn't see. But anyway, these are, are characteristics that are specific to the medium of photography. So when Richter starts to use a sort of blur-like quality, he's kind of referencing the medium of photography that, he's, that mediates his uh, approach to reality. So, so, so what he, he does often is he's kind of like, uh, he'll paint something and then he'll alter the surface by uh, you know, brushing across it somehow to, to create this kind of blurred effect. We're looking at Woman with Umbrella 1964. Again, it, it's very much after photography. Often they have this sort of black and white feel and black and white, uh, it, you know, photography is one of the, the places where black and whiteness uh, has survived into uh, the modern era. You know, it's, it's, it's unusual in painting just to restrict yourself to, to black and white. Uh, in, except for Chinese and Japanese ink painting, for example. If you, another, that's another example. Uh, so, yeah, if you use monochrome, you're, you're, you're referencing um, in a handmade medium of painting, this m medium of mass uh, reproduction. So, there is his more realist side, but here is his more abstract side. This is 1973 grey. Again, very uh, monochrome. Or oh, abstract painting, 1978. Some of these abstract paintings, they come from uh, making a, a small painting and then blowing, then blowing it up on a larger scale. So sort of intervention of reproductive techniques there. Just follow it through, but you know, but he will go back. To, it isn't that he starts with realism and then goes to abstraction. It, he can go back as well. So this is 1983 skull. Now, of course, it's a typical still life object of memento mori, still lives of the uh, 17th century Holland and so forth. But uh, yeah, here presented in this very cool deadpan way, photography provides a kind of alienating, distancing effect for him. Uh, he says uh, he by, that by using photographs one can avoid a certain stylization that is unavoidable in painting from nature. He says photography, it liberated me from personal experience. Abstract painting, 1985. And abstract painting called Forest, 1990. And this is the start he's still broadly working within today. It's a little bit similar, but um, more extreme to that kind of brushing of the surface of his painting to create a kind of photographic blur-like effect in that he's he, he'll put the color on, he'll make a kind of uh, abstract painting and then he'll push the 
push the colour across the, the surface using various spatulas or tools. Um, so you, you create, it creates this sort of layered uh, effect, some sense of, uh, of, of, of spatiality to it all. No particular imagery coming up and no, you know, no kind of uh, transcendental resonance like a Rothko painting or something like that. You're very much aware of the process through which the work was made and the materials out of which it's me it was made. So if you like, his dilemma is how do I make art in a, in a time when we, we can't sort of believe in anything? You know, there, we, there's nothing that uh, art, I don't have an Id ideology of purity or something that I'm trying to express through my art, but still I, I, I feel I want to be making art. There's no sort of depth there that the abstract expressionist paintings like Rothko tried to convey no sense of the sublime because you you know he can't believe in it so he he talks a fair bit about about this whole dilemma and let me just quote a few things to give you an idea he says I've let myself in for thinking and acting without the assistance of an ideology I have nothing to help me, no idea that I serve, and in return I'm told what is to be done, no rules to determine how things be done, no faith that points me in a particular direction, no picture of the future, no construction that gives higher meaning. That's 1984. Actually, there's a little bit similar to this in the ideas that Frank Stella um, deals with in his book called Working Space, you know, that's what, because he carries on painting, he's still working today, into to a sort of postmodern or, you know, post-purist era and has to find a kind of rationale for doing that. Victor talks about art that avoids all artificiality, that does not want to fool us anymore that weeds out skill and the complexity of reference is disturbing. How to create something meaningful in a situation of shifting grounds without offering a sort of false consolation, some kind of faked up sense of sublime depth or something like that without going, going back. At one point he quotes the composer John Cage. John Cage says, I have nothing to say and I am saying it. And Richter likes that idea. You know, Cage's idea is that he was always, he, he said how he was told as a student that the composer should always have something to say. And so he, he disliked that idea and felt that he, he didn't want to say anything. You know, the music just was what it was. And, and Richter kind of likes that idea. It's almost like, uh, a sort of deconstruction of painting. You know, deconstruction is not a demolition. It doesn't get rid of meaning, but it kind of puts meaning under erasure. It kind of gets rid of the aura of art, but still somehow the art has to go ahead and have a, a meaningfulness. But what kind of meaningfulness can we have if we don't believe in any um, grand narrative of meaning anymore? That's the kind of dilemma, if you like. It's not a, it's an abstract painting, but it's not made through a process of abstracting from nature or anything like that. There's no purifying going on, honing down going on. Accident or process uh, are very important. A little bit similar to Richter, in a way, is uh, another artist from a Germanic background, Sigmar Polk. This is his vacation picture, 1966. He also kind of will quote within his painting um, pre preformed, discovered, realistic images, but at the same time he will go towards abstraction but it's a it's a very ironic engagement in, in abstraction this is a good example of that from 1968 moderna kunst just modern art you know so it, he's using the kind of 
bits and pieces of imagery you might find in modern art or splashy marks, but they're, they're just sort of quoted. They have quotation marks around them rather than being used, they're being mentioned, you could say. So it's kind of a, an ironic stance about modern art. And it's a little bit similar. We see, we'll see when we come to look at the American pop artist Lichtenstein how he will also quote splashy abstract expressionist style brushwork in his uh, images. Not so dissimilar. Or here is uh, a work called The Spirits That Lend Strength Are Invisible, number three. This is from 1988. So here Polk actually, one thing about his work is he liked to play with quite different uh, uh, materials, you know. Um, this is, I have to check my notes to remember exactly what the materials are here, but it's, um, yeah, it's nickel, uh, the metal in an artificial resin suspended on, over on a, on camp canvas background. Well, here's an American example, Peter Haley. He's quite interesting as a writer about art. He's a sort of art critic as well. Well, sometimes he writes about his own art, sometimes about other people's art, as well as being an artist himself. This is his Dago Globe Prison of 1982. The whole idea of using Dago color, and you know, Dago color has a very uh, popular culture association to it is sort of uh, lack unrefined and kind of uh, it's, 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 yeah it's definitely association with with mass culture as a sort of easy attempt to interest you by using day glow colors and it has has a very modern feel you know there was never day glow because it, it's based on paints that didn't exist in earlier times. So, you know, it has a very un-old masterish feel about it if you use Dayglo. So to use it in a high art context is uh, deliberately sort of quotational of popular culture in a way. It has a kind of high-low dimension. And uh, the title Dayglo Prison, yes, well, it kind of looks like a sort of bars of a, a prison cell window, something like that, as well as looking at like some kind of very reductive abstract painting, such as the squares within squares of Joseph Albers, for instance. But also specifically, it's quite a quotation of a, there's a particular painting by Motherwell called The Little Spanish Prison, where the prison theme comes up and there's a kind of bar quality to the structure of the painting. So it's kind of quotationing quotation of abstract expressionists, but bringing in the world of, you know, in, in, imprisonment and confinement. He's someone who's read modern theory like uh, Foucault and, and Baudrillard. Yeah, here is the, 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 the Motherwell little Spanish prison from 1941 to 4 that he I think he's referencing. Sorry, it's a bad image. And then back to another Peter Haley, Blue Cell with Triple Conduit, 1986. So here the, the reference is, you know, like to circuit diagrams and other kind of very modern forms of uh, images. And also I think it's, uh, as the use of Dayglo too, it, it's a sort of reference to op art that sort of 1960s abstract art form that quickly kind of became popularized. Became, you know, eaten up by mass culture. A, a couple of quick examples further examples of um, abstract art beyond the era of belief. Sherry Levine, untitled Board Stripe Number 2, 1985. It's obviously a sort of reference back to Barnett Newman, but in a very deadpan, sort of flat kind of way. Or reference to 
Mondrian, you could say, you know, to Mondrian's checkerboard compositions like, like this one from 1919. This is her check number 10 of 1986. It's, again, it has a sort of op, op art quality, which to some extent Mondrian already prefigured. Yeah. Or I could give you as another artist who plays with abstraction as one possible mode it is Damien Hirst. You know, these kind of paintings that are made by spinning a disc around and splashing paint on it. It's the sort of thing that you, you know, such images are made uh, for kids in fairgrounds and places like that as a kind of playful sort of thing, but he's elevating it up to 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 high art context. And the, the title is deliberately sort of ironic and postmodern. Uh, you know, it's like the names of pizzas, you know, Four che beautiful four cheeses, spicy quattro stagione, Florentine, Michelangelo, Venetian glass, Pamplona painting, 1997. That's uh, uh, so. Yeah, he also makes these dot paintings, is, uh, or his assistants do mostly. Okay, that's that's enough. I want to move then to <coughs> pop. <coughs> So Papa, yeah, well, we shouldn't read too much into a term because, uh, you know, it's just the sort of label that, um, you know, that, that um, journalists really, art journalists came up with to, to link uh, a bunch of artists together. Um, actually, so, so the question sort of comes up, do they really have anything in common? How much are they all trying to do the same thing? Um, there's a distinction between British pop artists and American pop artists. Those are the two main places that pop art occurred at an early time. Of course, there were artists elsewhere who also experimented with that. A very simple sort of art historical t tool actually takes us a certain distance to understand pop in a very general way. And that is the idea of thinking of art as often uh, an, a reaction against the art of an earlier era. Uh, you know, that mannerism was often thought of as a, a reaction against the higher Renaissance and that sort of thing. So uh, you could see pop art as kind of breaking with or reacting against abstract expressionists, uh, whereas abstract expressionism is very sort of inward looking and concerned with the unconscious pop art is very outward looking uh, whereas abstract expressionism is very emotive pop art is very unemotional impersonal often very cool often very precise in style whereas abstract expression is often very brushy or loose and above all, you know, not abstract, using recognizable popular images, images from mass media or mass reproduced household objects. Objects and signs, one would want to say. The man-made world, not the world of nature, let alone the world of the unconscious. Sometimes, um, Things that different pop artists will say will place them as deliberately reacting against uh, abstract expressionism or the earlier kind of art. So, for example, at one point, Roy Lichtenstein describes himself as being anti experimental and anti contemplative, anti nuance, anti getting away from the tyranny of the rectangle, anti movement and light anti-mystery, anti-paint quality, anti-zen, and anti all those brilliant ideas of preceding movements, which everyone understands so thoroughly. So, yet at other times, maybe he, he, he doesn't want to make it sound so 
cut and dried like that. Um, a lot of his work involves parody, but uh, does if you parody something, does that mean that necessarily that you dislike it? You know, Lichtenstein again, he says, in parody, the implication is the perverse. And I feel that in my own work, I don't mean it to be that because I don't dislike the work that I'm parodying. The things that I have apparently parodied, I actually admire. So there's sort of am ambiguity there. And I think we can see continuities as well. For example, when we, we looked at de Kooning, we saw those um, images of Marilyn Monroe and so forth, or other kind of, of his women images dealt with mass reproduced imagery to some extent. So there's some kind of precedent even in abstract expressionism uh, for certain of things in, in, in pop. So pop art, again, I'm just giving a broad brushstroke picture of it before we look at particular examples. Often it uses strategies like repetition, we'll see that particularly in Warhol's work, but also elsewhere. And that kind of repetition, actually, again, it's it. it on the one hand, it seems very different from abstract art, but we'll see, you know, we've seen certain works, say, by Frank Stella, where the work is constructed out of repeating a certain mark. Um, pop art is often has a kind of double voice quality. You could say it's it's it's. You, you see the artist's voice, but you also hear the voice of whoever made the original imagery that the artist is playing with. So strategies of parody, quotation, irony. And a question, a big question is always, why are they doing that? You know, are they, are they against it? Are they, are they dealing with modern popular culture because they, they like it? or because they want to critique it, and uh, one can't assume the answer is always the same for each artist. Often there's this sort of clashing within the work of high and popular culture, or between what you could call a hot and cold, the hot meaning the subject matter is very strong in its associations, but the coldness comes in the way it's treated, it's presented in a very cool, objective manner. Handmade works, but handmade works that are about machine-made imagery. You know, there's that kind of binary opposition there within it. It's an art that belongs to the era of consumption more than the era of production, if you want to put it that way. If you think of the early 20th century, the paradigmatic kind of capitalist uh, object might be something like the Model T4, they all come off the production line looking exactly the same. Famously, uh, Ford himself said, you can have it in any color you like as long as it's black, you know. But, well, in our era of consumption, everything is about variety. It's all about, uh, um, you know, it's not about production, it's about consumption, if you like, the, 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 sh the shift has, has occurred. Okay, let's look at some examples. But what I want to do is to look first at British pop, which actually is slightly earlier in a way than American pop. And then I'll, then I'll move it uh, back to look at, uh, at, at American pop. So the first kind of phenomenon within British pop is what is often referred to as the independent group associated with the Institute of Contemporary Art in London. Uh, it dates back to the early 1950s and involves people like the art critic Lawrence Alloway, uh, the architectural critic Rainer Bannum, and then an artist like Richard Hamilton, whose work we're looking at here. Um, this is the most famous image associated with an exhibition that they put together in 1956 called This Is Tomorrow. Um, it actually appeared, uh, it wasn't like a, a, a standalone artwork in the exhibition, it appeared in the catalogue and it appeared uh, as a sort of photo mural, something like that, uh, in the 
exhibition it itself. So it's come to be thought of as a sort of independent artwork, but that's not quite how people first came across it. It's a collage, um, but collage of mostly of sort of popular cultural material. Um, it's very interested in the world of popular culture. So things like um, comic books, which you know Roy Lichtenstein becomes famous for using as his saucer, are here. Of course, nothing like this could happen without already the existence of, you know, all the way back through the 20th century of collage as uh, a stylistic uh, um, um, resource for, for, for modern art to bring together things of, in different styles within the same image. But there's some sort of self-consciousness about modern popular culture here objects uh, you know it's it's about in a sense it's about uh, new new items of, of material culture that are, are there in the post-war world like vacuum cleaners but it's also about the the images that advertise them ordinary cleaners reach only this far it's not about the cleaner it's about the advert that is promoting the, the cleaner if you, if you want to put it that way it's not the movie it's the poster for the the movie movie Richard Hamilton. Um, you know, he, he denies a sort of uh, satirical intention of you know, trying to sort of critique uh, modern culture. Puts it this way he says, in spite of their contrived sophistication, my paintings are for me curiously ingenuous, like Marilyn Monroe. At first sight, it is easy to mistake their intentions as a satirical. It looks as though uh, the painting is a sardonic comment on our society. But I would like to think of my purpose as a, a search for what is epic in everyday objects and everyday attitudes. Irony has no place in it, except insofar as irony is part of the ad man's repertoire. The ad man means kind of the, the artist working, producing, advertising imagery. So he's saying irony is just another tool that is already there in popular culture. So to be to use irony is not somehow to be able to stand back above what that popular culture is doing. It's almost like um, um, the opinion of Baudelaire that the role of art is to capture what is specific to the our particular modern era and in that case in our case it happens to be this so sometimes he's he's using painting <coughs> homage our chrysler core because it's sort of a fake uh, French title looking at American popular culture the kind of, you know the, this is what I mean by saying you know that the emphasis is more towards consumption rather than production you know the, the same cars are constantly changing shape and you can get them in different colors and um, all this is kind of very much part of the, the, the world of the 1950s a kind of post-war world of beginning of affluence you know especially in America where apart from Pearl Harbor it more or less escaped actual destruction in the war itself swinging London 1968 to 9 it, it's taking a, a famous news photo of the time and playing around with it this photo is of the the rocks musician Mick Jagger and a famous art dealer of the time being arrested on a, a drugs offense which was a big issue in the, the media at that time
fashion plate cosmetic study in 1969. There are a whole sort of series of these that he produces. So it's, a, it's about the world of appearances, cosmetics and the fashion uh, photography that kind of plays with appearances, projects certain imagery of how women should be and or make what is considered seductive and tries to seduce the, the, uh, the, the consumer to buy based on all these things. So here he is sort of deconstructing all these things. David Hockney, who's I suppose become famous outside of the context of, of 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 pop art itself, but you know this is his early work. This is 1962, tea painting in an illusionistic style. 61 to two. So that that even the title, the idea that he talks about this is a painting in a certain style. You know that's already gives you the idea that. You could paint in whatever style you want. The, the, you know, you, you, oh, this is in this style, then it's in another style. It, it's almost like uh, the, the language of of design, or you know, oh well, this this year we're going to do it in a so and so style, and then next year we'll do it in another style. Normally, artists, uh, you know, you can't think of Van Gogh apart from the style that he uses. You can't separate him out from it. But uh, in this kind of more ironic era, you want to, to imagine you could separate yourself out from, from your style. You could, you, you could uh, uh, use a variety of different styles. So, so yeah, uh, it, it, he's calling it uh, illusionistic style, yes, because there's a sense of perspective to represent a, what it is as a box of a particular brand of tea that was very common in England at that time, Tai Fu tea. Um, <coughs> well, <coughs> playing with brands, that's uh, something, advertising imagery, that's something we'll see in American pop art too. But the difference here is the kind of very handmade, personal touch and approach to it. It's almost autobiographical. You know, he, he used to, when he was a student at the Royal College of Art, he would arrive very early in the morning before the canteen it opens. So he had to make his own tea, so he'd have his own uh, t tea there in his, his studio space and everything. So it's a, there's a sort of biographic dimension to it. it. It refers to, you know, illusionistic painting, as the title says, but also to the shaped canvases of modern abstract art, you know, so it's playing around with more than one style deconstructively. Maybe you know other artists' uh, reference to or, you know things like uh, graffiti, uh, different different styles coming together. Grand procession of dignitaries in the semi-Egyptian style. So not only you know you can paint in one style or another style, but you can paint in a semi-something style. You know, uh, that's kind of already uh, takes it a little bit further. And and writing the title onto the painting in this sort of faux naive way, almost like a child might do, collaging on a, a bit of a sort of curtain that creates the, the sense of the these figures are on display. It's a little bit inspired by a poem by the Alexandria-based poet called Kavafi, who wrote a poem called Waiting for the Barbarians. That's probably his most famous poem about these sort of dignitaries all dressing up to wait in the, you know in such a way that they would impress the barbarians who are about to arrive although in fact the barbarians never come you know here you have these sort of figures dressed up in these big costumes to make themselves seem bigger than they really are one is a sort of bishop's costume another is maybe it's a sort of uh, official's uh, civil servant or a, a mandarin's costume and another is a soldier's costume this would be recognizable in England as the costume of a 
of a Chelsea pensioner. There's a certain kind of old people's home for ex soldiers, and uh, so it's, it has a sort of military connotation. Instead of wearing medals, it's just like little stencil pictures of people. Maybe it's how many people he's killed, or, or something like that, <laughs> is the idea. And uh, yeah. He is the semi-Egyptian comes, I suppose, here is an Egyptian figure, but the profile view uh, uh, of the faces, but the frontal view of the body, that's something that is semi-Egyptian, if, if you like about it all. All against the raw canvas background, well, that's uh, something that... Um, yeah, it kind of uh, references uh, something that you see in certain uh, contemporary abstract painting, you know, uh, the use of raw canvas. Clearly it's also children's art and, and, and maybe du buffet, other kinds of uh, sort of naive influences like that. It's really a rather large painting, about sort of seven by eleven foot. So the scale was determined in advance. He he got hold of a large stretcher for the for the for the painting, and then he, you know, adjusted to the to that possibility. Even the length of his titles are also sort of self-conscious because if if your title is very long, it stands out in the catalogue of the exhibition. You know, the the, uh, the like a student show or something like that alongside all the other, other other works. Yours is the one that has the really long title. It sort of might be to draw attention to you. First Marriage, A Marriage of Style, 1962. So yeah, self-consciously in the titles about what happens when different things clash together that you don't need to have a unified style anymore. It's hard to imagine someone like Jackson Pollock being able to paint in two styles within the same canvas. But here, only a few years later really, Hockney is, is happy to do that. Play, style is something you can play with. He says, I realized that you could play with style in a painting to make a collage, not literally a collage, but collage like collage using different materials. You could paint something one way in this corner and another way in another corner and the picture didn't need a unity of style to have unity. Yeah, so it's a kind of willing acceptance of internal diversity in that way. Or self-conscious reference. It's art about art. Of course, that's a very big theme through the whole 20th century. There's so much art that could be said to be art about art. And pop art is a big part of that story. Uh, I mean, the most simplistic view of pop art is to say it's high art about popular culture, Campbell's soup cans or something like that. But it's also a lot of it is art about art. You know, even Andy Warhol, he's making art about Mona Lisa and so forth. Lichtenstein is making a lot of art about art. Well, Hockney too, this is sort of art about art. You could imagine it's like someone in a standing next to a uh, Egyptian figure in a museum and suddenly you get a fi funny kind of sense as if they're a married couple, you know, a, uh, uh, a kind of marriage, a strange first marriage, you call a marriage of style. Oh yeah, again the sort of bare canvas and the kind of references, it could be like Kenneth Nolan's painting or something like that, the kind of target-like quality. This is him in America. He moved to America in this sort of, this is, you know, from 1967. So he was teaching in UCLA, 66 to 7, living in Santa Monica, 1968, and actually ends up spending most of his life in LA. He still keeps a studio there. Um, and his images of Los Angeles have have become really sort of defining of the, the city. We know that city through his images as much as anything else. So this is a bigger splash, one of his most famous paintings. 
a lot of uh, works he produced are interested in water as a subject because water is notoriously difficult to represent. How can you capture something that's constantly moving in a static medium of a, of a painting? So there are a lot of water studies of one kind or another. The subject of the swing, swimming pool, well especially to, <coughs> especially to someone coming from Britain with a much colder climate, the idea of having an outdoor swimming pool uh, is, would be a very unusual thing, you know. Uh, when would you get to use it, you know. <laughs> but in Los Angeles, well A, it's more affluent, especially compared to how Britain was at that time. But also, it's a warmer climate, so it's it's not such an unusual thing to have a, a swimming pool, perhaps. So anyway, it's 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 something you you know if you're you're passing over uh, a city like Los Angeles uh, in a in a plane, you'll see lots and lots of the as it comes into land, you'll see lots and lots of swimming pools. So it's definitely something an outsider would notice. Sometimes it's the outsider who notice the thing which is common, but which the insider sort of maybe take a little bit for granted. It's just something they've grown up with. Uh, he, he got hold of a, a magazine, uh, well, no, sort of a, a booklet or brochure, uh, uh, how, to, uh, how to build swimming pools. He found it on a newsstand in Hollywood. So again, it's mediated by imagery. It's not about swimming pools, it's about images of swimming pools, how, how swimming pools are presented. <coughs> Actually, if you took away the, the, the splash, you took away the chair, you took away the, the tops of the palm trees, it would be fairly abstract, you know, just a few blocks of colour, almost Mondrian-like in a way. Um, most of the painting was done with using a roller, sort of flat areas of colour that you could fill in fairly quickly but there was one part of the painting which took a long time and so that was very ironic in a way that the thing which is instantaneous the splash actually took ages because he had to meticulously make an image of a splash you know, so it's exactly the opposite of Jackson Pollock pouring paint very quickly of course, it's a sort of reference to Jackson Pollock's painting as much as it is a, uh, a reference to swimming pools and water, water in motion. It, it, it is about art about art still, I think. The splash took about two weeks to paint, apparently. The, s the fast thing is that is slow, the slow thing is fast. <laughs> Actually, I'm jumping back in time, but um, this is 1961. We two boys together clinging. Just, uh, because Hockney was gay, and so I'm just showing you a kind of a example of a kind of gay art artwork by him. Uh, of course, at that point in time, 1961, it's illegal to be gay in the UK. Uh, maybe that's all part of why he, he, he moved to California. And since it's sort of a taboo subject at that time, then the very stylized treatment that helps you deal with that in a way that doesn't uh, cause too much uh, offence, it creates a certain kind of a bleakness about things. There's even a sort of codedness for two is sort of apparently it's a reference to, you know, letters of the alphabet, four is D, two is B. So D, B, apparently it's, it's so, I've been told it stands for doll boy, so it's some kind of terminology, you know, that was popular at that time. Mr. and Mrs. Clark and Percy, 1970. Ozzie Clark, who was she was a fashion designer. Um, sorry, Celia Clark. Uh, she's really a, a kind of 
a model that he comes back to again and again, you know, or, or through through his life, her life. Um, he rarely has more than two sitters in a portrait. Again, it's a sort of slightly perverse reaction against something he was told at the Bradford Art School that you can't. He was told you can't make an interesting composition unless you have at least three figures in it. You know, so he's sort of deliberately uh, working against that. <coughs> he shifts from style, you know, so here it's almost like a sort of photo realism instead of using the, the more caricatured or kind of naive style. So through his career you're seeing very different idioms. He's working from a, a photo or a series of photos. He's made lots of individual drawings before he started work on the painting study. So pretty much the composition is already worked out. The lilies on the table, it, it gives it a feeling almost a little bit like a kind of um, sort of annunciation image. If, we, if, if you're looking at it from someone, a uh, point of view of someone who's learned in the history of art, especially since you have one figure that seems to be a sort of visitor and one that seems to be seated, that's, uh, that's the format of a annunciation, you know, the angel is coming in and Mary is seated, except here it's the male figure who's seated and the female figure who's standing. That's a reversal of our normal expectation to have the man lower down than the woman. I can remember, for example, uh, seeing a street portrait artist who was painting a husband and wife, and the, the husband was much shorter than his wife, but the artist painted the two heads where the, the man's head was in the top right-hand corner and the wife's head was in the bottom left-hand corner to somehow put him bigger, <laughs> taller than his, his wife. Uh, so that th this is working against tho those kind of expectations. Contrejour, the light coming in through the window, not coming from our side, clarifying uh, the, the forms, working working sort of against us in that way. He he, he does that in other images too. Apparently, when his mother saw it, she said, "Oh." Our uh, David never could draw feet, you know, so he, his feet are sort of hidden in a thick uh, carpet. Well, quickly I'll go through some of his other work, but maybe I should give you a little break now. Um, we'll come back to, to this. I've, I've, I've kept you a bit late for your break, but I wanted to develop a, a little bit of momentum into looking at pop art first. <laughs>